you have to be resourceful and find a way. There's so many different avenues, so many different resources for these young folks to be able to educate themselves and stuff that wasn't available when I was young in the industry, right? So much information out there. So they really have to be dedicated to the learning part of it and not to waste the opportunities when they're out with our actual technicians riding along. Welcome to the Waste No Day podcast, a podcast specifically for and about the home services industry as it relates to plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical. More than a podcast, Waste No Day is a credo, a determination, a mindset. It is a never-ending discipline. It is a refuse-to-lose pursuit. It is a wake-up call every morning to waste no day. Now here's your hosts, Brian Burton and Nate Minnick. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Waste Snow Day podcast. Your hosts, Nate and Brian, hanging out with you again and looking forward to a great show. We have one of the good ones coming back for another round. That's right. Lawrence Castillo is joining us again, and we're going to have a great conversation with him about taking your career to the next level. Really looking forward to diving in on that subject. We're going to try to hit it from the the ground level in terms of going from rookie to you know middle ground, and then also going from that high tier to an even higher tier as well. So it's going to be a good show, and I'm sure you're going to appreciate it. But as always, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking to you in the introduction here, and we're going to start that off by turning to Brian for our quote. Service is black and white. Hospitality is color. Black and white means you're doing your job with competence and efficiency. Color means you make people feel great about the job you're doing for them. Getting the right plate to the right person at the right table is service. Genuinely engaging with the person you're serving so you can make an authentic connection, that's hospitality. Will Gadara from Unreasonable Hospitality, which is a, a audio book I'm just about to finish. That's just it's just rocking my world. I'm in love with this book. You know the sacrificial service mantra that I always taught in my training, and always tried to constantly groom technicians and salespeople into this. You know, because you know what we're about. Like we're leaders, managers of businesses. I never want to discount the fact that we're all there. We're all there structured in a way that we're all responsible for bringing money into the business. That is what a business exists for, right? So it's easy the higher you get in leadership positions to become solely focused on that piece. Like this is my job. Everybody else has to do their job and it'll all work out. Well, it's not the most effective way to do things. So I'm, I'm constantly and have always constantly tried to add in that sacrificial service piece that I saw as like, you know, be so focused on your client that it can cost you, that it can actually be painful to you. Like that's how dedicated you are to this other human being or family that you're serving. And then in leadership and try to do the same thing, be so dedicated to your team that it can cost you that you have to sacrifice for it. And I don't feel like I've ever been great at getting that, at articulating that point, you know, at at really making other people feel what I feel when I'm talking about that. Well, I just read a whole book about it. (laughs) And that book is called Unreasonable Hospitality. And that book is about, by Will Gadara. And it's, he, I can never remember the name of this restaurant. Oh, crying out loud. They use uh, three initials for it, but. I thought it was the address of the street or whatever in New York. It's why don't you pretend you're listening to me like you do, you know, while you're actually on your phone (laughs) when we're recording (laughs) and go ahead and look that up (laughs) while I uh, just pontificate about absolutely nothing for a minute and a half. Uh, uh, Just make it another Monday, Brian. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Welcome to Waste No Day. But he built this he and his team built this restaurant that became the number one restaurant in the world in New York city. 11 Madison park. That's it. EM EMP 11 Madison park. See, look at that. We were both right. It's the first time in waste no day history. 
Well, I mean, because we were both right, but neither of us actually had the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you thought it was letters. I thought it was numbers. It turns yeah, out we're, we're both, we were both right. right, but somehow wrong. If the answer to the test was the name of the place, we both got it wrong. <laughs> So I'll take my walk and I'll walk that 45 to an hour and occasionally, rarely, but occasionally I get to listen to the book the whole time since I've been doing this. And, you know, I'm on the, you know, get pumped, get motivated. Let's go, baby. Rah, rah, rah. Fist bump, pat on the back, get everybody out and inspired. And then I'll take this walk and I'm listening to what I would call sacrificial service mindset, this unreasonable hospitality. And then Right about the time technicians start calling me from their call, struggling with an objection or difficult situation with the client or, you know, wants to celebrate or whatever. It's just in time because I've now switched over to this unreasonable hospitality mindset. And this is a mindset of just utter service. I mean, it's not like there is no talk of you need to let people trample over you and be disrespectful and, and nothing like that. That's not how they get down. In fact, they talk about the fact that they will fire clients from that place. Like you're just not allowed here anymore. We're not going to tolerate that. But for the most part, you know, it, it is a bend over backwards to serve mindset. And that mindset got them the number one restaurant in the world. So anyway, I don't think there's any level of an organization where you shouldn't have this kind of focus. And I think if everyone in any type of organization was to read this book, oh, I'm sorry. That's that's what I was going to say was like, I listened to it on Audible, but if I was reading it in a book, this would be one of those books that I was making tons of notes in and circling things. And like, and you know, like I I read that quote from it earlier. I don't have the actual paper book. I, I I have no way to, so all of that quote right there, I just like got, I paused it. I like got, or no, I took a screenshot of where that was and I got back to the shop and I played it and I wrote it down and I had to pause <laughs> it back up 15 seconds because I, I couldn't catch it. And I start writing again and back up 15 seconds and start writing again. But there are so many parts like that in that book that I would absolutely litter that book. It would be destroyed by the time I got done reading it. So if you're a reader, for sure, get your pen and your highlighter out and get this book in you. If you're an audio person like myself, get to it because you're going to have to listen to it two or three times. So you better get after it. And going back to that quote, Brian, you know, something that struck me as you were reading that is the most likely time when we stop using color and focus just on black and white is in distressed situations of overcapacity, right? So you know, give you a couple of examples. Uh, at my office, you know, we just went through three to four weeks of extreme heat. And I mean, like intense heat for our locale. And, you know, things are starting to break and the systems are starting to fail and people are getting tired and, you know, the call center is going crazy and all these things, right? And so what do we do? We go back to like the basic, the most basic level of things, just that black and white uh, you know, tornadoes just went through Arkansas a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago. And, you know, they're running around the clock trying to get electric and all the utilities and all the electric, you know, services back on and all these types of things. Or, you know, a uh, hurricane just went through Texas and all the things that come through that and you name it, right? So in these moments of significant stress, when systems are tested and put to their max and maybe even over their max, we often stop using color because we say things like, well, we don't, we don't have time to go the extra mile. We don't have time to put uh, that extra level of effort into it. We just got to go, right? Like we just got to be in the black and white section. And while there is validity to like, you know, triaging a situation and focusing on life-saving efforts as opposed to broken toes and things like that, it's also something that we need to be cognitively aware that we are missing out on or that the client is missing out on like this is not the top level of service that we could be should be providing you know because we're stressed out about running 10 calls today and by running 10 calls it means we can't do that extra that extra 15 minutes with that client or you know the dispatchers all chirping on our phone saying like yo you got to you got to get out of there like get that thing done and get moving right 
and yet you're shortcutting the experience for the client. You're not providing that unreasonable level of hospitality and you're forcing them and yourself to live in the black and white. And again, I'm not saying that there isn't situations and scenarios where that absolutely has to happen, but it's done at a cost. And the cost is a lesser experience for everybody. Uh, and it is something that, you know, it can be a turnoff to people because a lot of times in these stress situations, you're seeing the most new clients that your company has ever seen before. You know, every other person that you go to is a new client and, you know, because everybody needs the service. And so you're seeing all these new clients and new clients and new clients. And this is your one time to show them the full color, the full color portrayal of who you are and what your company does. And unfortunately, you stripped it down to just grayscale and said, this is the best I can give you because I got a lot of other stuff to do. And it's shortcutting the process for them. And it leaves them with a, a perception that this is what you do, that this is the level of service you provide. And I think it, it's worth considering in those stress situations, are there times when we need to slow everybody down, you know, turn the marketing off, stop booking as many calls, stop trying to overload the system and just focus on giving the best experience to as many people possible and not shortchanging it. So great way to start off, Brian. Uh, really appreciate the thought exercise there and hope it was beneficial for you, the listener as well. But if it wasn't, it was for me. So that's good enough. Well, I'm glad one of us was uh, <laughs> mentally stimulated. Right, right? <laughs> no, you guys better have got a lot out of that because you know I don't I don't write a whole lot, and I had to write my butt off for that. So <laughs> I was so excited to write. Like, here, look, you can explain this to them. Oh my word! You hand wrote it. I see it. I hand wrote it on a yellow notepad, and then I took a screenshot of it with my phone. Is that in and crayon? And are your K's backwards? Uh, uh, I don't think there are any K's in there, actually. Detroit public <laughs> education at its finest. I'm not sure what they are. <laughs> yeah, you're all lucky I, I could read it. So there's that. But yeah, was so as I was writing every sentence on the notepad, I was, I was sitting there thinking, like, I cannot wait to share this with the audience and hope. And, you know, there's a little story around it. So and I don't want to go into it, but read the book. It's a great part of the story. A woman said this to him, this line to him in an interview where he was interviewing her. And it was it was captivating to him as it was to me. And uh, I just couldn't wait. I could not wait to get on here and share it and hope it has some, some impact on everybody. So, Well, speaking of writing things down, Brian, it's time for the part of the show where we highlight somebody who has taken the time to write Let's something go. down. And they've put it on a review and added it to the Waste No Day show. So Brian, who are we highlighting today? BFPNWA, son. Five stars. I've quite easily 10X'd not only my business, but many aspects of my life by listening to Waste No Day when I'm driving. Listening to Brian and Nate and their guests has been one of the highest ROIs that are improving my sales, encouraging my team, and becoming the best operator possible to sacrificially serve our community. What? I didn't even know that. Whoa. And if you are skeptical about what they're espousing, just fly over to Phoenix and spend two days with Brian, please don't, and his team like I did. <laughs> <laughs> or head over to Lancaster, yes, to see <laughs> Nate and his team. You will be changed and you will begin setting and achieving goals you didn't even think were possible. Chim Richels. All right. Jim Richels. I like it. I appreciate the review, man. And uh, <laughs> that that's great. Ben, ben Rowell. Okay. I, I mean, when you said NWA, that's kind of what I was thinking. But yeah, that's uh, Ben Franklin Plumbing, Northwest Arkansas. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, we do have guests come in typically on Friday mornings. And I'm, you know, it's just like when I was in Lancaster, we did it on Wednesdays. But here in Phoenix, we do it on Fridays. And if you're interested and you're in town, I would make a special trip for it, but you want to come through and, and hang for a few hours, wide open. Just shoot me a text, but get on there early because it can get pretty booked up. That's great. And we're excited to have somebody who has not, their own experience. On. Not not a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make that part clear. <laughs> not looking to do weekends, huh? 
<laughs> not looking to do a couple days. <laughs> Doesn't matter what days it's on. <laughs> well, I tell you what, our next guest coming up here, he is a gentleman who has been at several shops and he is one who feels like the industry has given him so much that he just wants to give back. You know, and it, it's great to hear from him. And we're super excited to have Lawrence back on the show. As I mentioned, he's been on the show before. So if you're looking to catch a great two-parter today, uh, we'll give you that information here shortly about which episode he was on. But we know you're going to enjoy this one as we talk about elevating your career mm -hmm. and taking it to the next level. And so it's time to put Mr. Lawrence Castillo in your passenger seat. Our guest today is Lawrence Castillo. He is joining us as the one of the partners of Brody Pinnell, an operator and HVAC company in Los Angeles. He's a widely respected industry veteran and an operations expert who has worked for Jim Abrams at Clockwork Home Services and has been the GM of Service Champions working for Leland Smith. He is now one of the owners and operating partner of Brody Pinnell in Los Angeles, as I mentioned, and has recently even added Absolute Airflow to his portfolio of brands. Now with working on 300 plus employees, we are excited to bring him back on the show to talk to you today about elevating your career. Welcome back, Lawrence. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, great to be here and had such a great time last time with you guys and really looking forward to having a conversation today. Yeah, buddy. It was good to talk to you again the other day. It's been far too long and I thoroughly enjoy our conversations. I always feel like I walk away a little bit smarter about the industry and life in general. And uh, really enjoyed your first episode. It was one that I was every time around that time, somebody, a manager or owner got a hold of me and asked, like, uh, what do I do for this? Who do I need to talk to? I was like, listen to this episode and then try and get in contact with him. <laughs> if he accepts your call, consider it your lucky day. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think back in my life and in, in the trades and, you know, there are people that played huge roles and they lent information to me and, and helped me along the way. And I really believe in the repayment and, you know, if there are contractors out there that I can help however I can. And that's why I do this stuff is just, you know, I think we all have a, a debt to pay and, you know, heating and air conditioning has been great to me. So I'm always happy to help and uh, just want to help as many people as I can. Yeah, I love that perspective, Lawrence. And uh, just in case for our listeners, if you did miss that episode, it was back on January 23rd of 2023. It's called A Million Dollar Education. Uh, and it was a great episode there. So we appreciate you returning for part two, the next step here. And we're going to be talking about taking your career even higher. And we're looking forward to that conversation. Before we do, though, if people are not familiar with you, or perhaps they haven't listened to that first episode, why don't you give us a quick summary of your background in the trades and where you're at now? Sure. I've been doing this for some 25 years now, and it's sort of flown by. And, you know, it started for me, small beginnings. I went to work as the general manager of a small heating and air conditioning company in, in Simi Valley. The name of the company was Air King. And a friend of mine bought it and he was just, he was having a tough time making a go of it. He had worked for a a commercial company called ACO here in Southern California. And he got into it and things just didn't go the way that he had planned. And so he wanted to know if I would like take a shot at fixing things. And, you know, I walked in the door and just had to educate myself. I had no background. I wasn't from the trade school. I wasn't a career technician. I was just a, a guy that had run a family business and had a little success with that. And I think he recognized that and gave me an opportunity. And that worked out and it turned into another opportunity for me and that worked out. And, you know, those years, it just became a bigger opportunity and a, a bigger company to run. And, you know, it ended up at Service Champions here in, in Orange County. And, you know, that was certainly the biggest company that I had ever been responsible for. And, you know, we had a lot of people and a lot of trucks and a lot of revenue running through that business every day. And I think that you know, I, the education that I got there, the things that I saw there, I was able to really take those with me and utilize that stuff in the rest of my career. And, you know, I, here at Brody Pinnell in Los Angeles, me and my partners have a great business that over the last three and a half years, we've 
really driven to great heights and we've purchased uh, a bunch of other businesses, growing portfolio. So I think it's the processes and the stuff that I, I learned along my, you know, travels that really made the difference for me. And I'm still using it all today and, and it's all worked for me. So how many people do you guys have now? Between all the businesses, I have about 300 here in our portfolio. And, you know, that's gonna, I've got another one coming here pretty soon. And so it just continues to grow. A lot of good people. And I'm as busy as I've ever been. You know, I'm, I was in San Diego yesterday at my shop down there and I'm at Brody today and I'll be at Absolute tomorrow. And, you know, just trying to help wherever I can. I, I have the benefit of experience. I have general managers in these locations that some of them are, it's the first time they've been responsible for, you know, an operation. They come from a service manager role or, you know, some other role within the business. And so I'm just trying to make my way around, make sure that I provide some good advice and help them where I can and try to identify the things in these businesses that might make a difference. So that's how I'm spending my time these days. So you've about, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were at 100 employees when we had you on uh, about a year and a half ago. So you've tripled, tripled at least your responsibility. Hopefully the money, your uh, paycheck too, but. Oh, well, I'm, uh, you know, I feel fortunate, you know, to have stumbled into Brody Pinnell. You know, it was just a really small business, 34 people when I walked into the door. And so at Brody, we're 170 now, and that's in three and a half years time. It's been a great, a great growth pattern. And, and then the other businesses make up the other 130 employees. But here at Brody, certainly, I think we, you know, we started a, since we last spoke, I, I started my own school, hired a, someone to teach my technicians and not just the technicians, but the people that we recruit into the school, the people they're you know, they're really off the street, people that are interested to be in the trades. And so we, we train our own technicians here and, um, that's made a huge difference. That's, you know, if you want to accumulate manpower, that's the way to do it. And a lot of really smart people in the industry across America with very successful businesses do just that. And, um, so we just graduated a class on Monday and, um, looking forward to our, our next class starting. So, well, that's as good a place as any to segue into our topic, Lawrence, uh, the school, which is really fascinating. I I've been to service champions. I've seen their school. It's amazing. I've heard of other schools. We've done, uh, variations of schools at my shop. And I do think it is a really unique opportunity for a company to not only secure their farm system, but to ensure that the farm system is operating with the policies and procedures and systems that are best suited for your business and the ones that you're really banking on for success, as opposed to trying to wrangle in, you know, ex employees from here and bad habits from there and everything else. So when you are starting on the school piece, you know, and you were focusing on, all right, what is going to be our approach at like, even what are we looking for in terms of raw talent and ingredients? Like, what are we going to be, um, who are we going to be seeking out when it comes to getting students to even join the trades? What were some of your focal points that you're like, all right, you know, we want, we want driven people. We want ex athletes. Uh, you know, we want conversationalists, uh, we want mechanics. What were some of the, like the non-negotiables that you had to have to get into that school. I think that this all goes back to what we did at Service Champions. And this was probably 2011 or 12. But at that time, we knew we wanted to grow the business. And we couldn't do it just taking guys from other companies, waiting to see what walked in the door. That's not a growth plan. So we spent $37,000 on a training room and installed a bunch of working systems, ordered some high top tables and chairs, put in an audio video system. And my service managers, I was the general manager at the time, and my service managers worked really hard on writing a curriculum. And we were sort of winging it, but we started. And we would have these open cattle calls. We would have, you know, 50, 60 people walking in the door. And they were people that were interested in, you know, becoming a technician. So 
we would do these big interviews and we would whittle it down. And, and then all of a sudden you have training classes and, you know, what I'm doing here is just, it's a very close variation to that. The response has been incredibly, it's just been huge. I had our last training class, we had 2000 applicants. Wow. <laughs> 2000 and we accepted, what? we accepted 15. Oh my word. <laughs> It's true. My recruiting department, we decided that it was just such a task to try to whittle it down. So between our first class and our second class, we decided that we would only take people who submitted a video along with their application as a way to, you know, just narrow it down further. But we're looking for communicators. We're looking for people that our customers will trust in their home. We're looking for folks that we think will be a good ambassador for our business, people that have the same values. And there are really a lot of great people out there. We did a hiring event here today for inside staff, and we hired two customer service agents out of this. So that whole process of, you know, wrangling 20 or 30 or 40 people and bringing them into your meeting room and seeing if, you know, you can roll the dice and, and roll sevens and, and find somebody worth hiring, it's worthwhile. This is, we've done three of these at our businesses just this week and we've hired people. And so for the, the trade school though, we're looking for the communicators. We're looking for just people that we think will represent the company well, and we invest the time in them. It's a 12 week program. And the beauty of this for them is that if they were to go to trade school, they're going to write a check for $20,000. They're going to spend 10 months of their life watching an instructor teach them and they're going to be working on four or five systems in a single room inside of the school. If they come here, they're not writing a check. We're paying them. They're in class with their group. And not only are we doing the classroom stuff, but they are able to get in a van and ride along with a Nate certified senior service technician, go into a house, see every application of equipment that you'll ever see. They're able to go on an install and crawl under a house or crawl into the attic and, you know, see what it's like to do the work. So they've really integrated themselves as a part of the business during this 12 week process. And by the time they graduate and we do a huge graduation ceremony and they're already a part of the business, they're not showing up to their first day of work as a stranger. Everybody knows them. They know everybody. So that's, you know, that's been the business model. And, and I think that the school is really helping us to, you know, get on the trajectory that we want. And as well, we're able to select people that we can, you know, later disperse to any of the businesses, right? If you want people for your Orange County location, you run an ad in Orange County and you select people from there. They come here to Brody and they go through those, those 12 weeks. And then at the end, they go and work at Absolute in Orange County. So it's been great and really proud of, you know, the efforts that we've made. And it's a great plan. As you should be. And that's really an amazing offering that your company does. Curious, what is your graduation rate? Uh, is it 100% successful or do you lose a couple along the way? We've lost a couple along the way in both classes. I think the first class we started at 21 um, I think we probably graduated 16. Uh, the second one, same thing. You lose three or four along the way. So, uh, you know, and that, that was exactly what used to happen at Service Champions as well. There's going to be some attrition, right? But during that, you know, you recruit, you recruit 20 and you graduate 14 or 15. Of those 14 or 15, six months from now, let's say 11 or 12 are still with the business. Of those 11 or 12, you're going to have two rock stars right? And a bunch of guys filling in the gaps elsewhere. And, you know, it's, uh, but you do lose a few along the way, but, you know, we're also losing a few along the way here in the rest of the business as well. It's just, if you have a good recruiting plan, that doesn't affect you. So. Yeah. And no doubt on that. Yeah. Well, there's always the uh, emotional effect. If you're like me and I know you are in this way is that you get somewhat attached to 
freaking everybody that you bring into the business. <laughs> like there's always that relationship built and it's difficult to part whether it's whether it's our doing or their doing. It's it's just not something you ever want to do. But let's say so let's gear up for some technician talk here and start moving toward development. So you get them through the class and the class is mostly technical, although I'm I'm sure there's some soft skills involved there as well. So you get them out of the class and what we want to talk about is really, I would say, apprentice to high level successful salesperson and kind of everything in between as, as time allows. You've seen people go from probably sweeping floors and running parts to some of the highest producers in our industry have, have trained under you. So what is the process if there is one or what are the key things that people need to focus on starting at that lowest level, the, the entry place and working our way up? I think that as we've brought these people in from off the street with no experience and we've you know given them a great opportunity, every day is a discovery for us because we're trying to learn these people and we're trying to see how they're going to fit in the business 12 weeks from now when they graduate. And, you know, I don't know that they really look at it this way, but there's an interview going on every day for them. They have to come and show us their best. And we're learning about their mannerisms and how they are with customers and how they are with their teammates. And, you know, I try to give them as much advice as possible when this whole thing starts about, you know, if you're able to make it to class on time and you're studious and you pass your tests, that's what we want to see as managers. We want to, because that's what's going to, you know, we're going to place them after they're done with the school. So where they end up is really a byproduct of how they are during those 12 weeks. And, you know, and I, I try to give them plenty of advice about a number of things, but one of those things is that they have to be self-directed learners, right? There's only so much teaching that we can do in the meeting room. We have something, you know, we have a tablet for each of them and they're able to go home at night and, and do extra work. And we have something called interplay learning, which uh, is sort of a virtual reality thing. And we have that for all of our technicians. But these young technicians, you know, if they choose to do so, they can spend time outside of here trying to become an expert, right? The valedictorian of this last class, he got up and did his speech and he spoke to everybody about the fact that he was so serious that he would, you know, go home and eat dinner and then he would just get right back on that tablet and start to learn more. So I think that that's, that's a big thing is that there's only so much we can do in the rooms, in the meeting room. They have to be the kind of self-directed learner that wants more. And we talk to them about being the expert. And if you're going to be the expert that the customer expects in the home, you have to be resourceful and find a way. There's so many different avenues, so many different resources for these young folks to be able to educate themselves and stuff that wasn't available when I was young in the industry, right? So much information out there. So they really have to be dedicated to the learning part of it. And, you know, not to waste the opportunities when they're out with our actual technicians riding along. They you know, they, they have the chance to pick the brain and work side by side with all of these people as, as they're making their way through school. So they need to, you know, utilize that and talk to these guys and become friendly so that you have a great little network of people to support you once you're on your own. So I think it starts with some of those things. You know, we teach only so much in the classroom. You have to be responsible for some of your own education. And, uh, we talk about that regularly with them. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense, Lawrence, especially the autonomous mindset, like the self-drive, you know, the, the person who's going to take the education by the horns and they're going to get their money's worth or their efforts worth out of it. Like they're not going to shortchange themselves, realizing that the only person they're hurting is themselves. But on the inverse of that, you know, the reason I asked you about like the success rate or the graduation rate I'm curious about the people that don't make the cut. And I'm sure some people volunteer their way out and some people are voluntold their way out, uh, depending. But um, when you kind of like holistically look at the people that are dropping out, whether at any point, whether it's during the actual school time or, you know, post 90 days graduation, somewhere they eventually find their way out of the company. 
What are some of the characteristics that you're noticing in the people who are dropping out or exiting that you're like, okay, I'm seeing a pattern here. And then how can we use that to like get better as an industry in the trade? Like how can we call that out in ourselves as tradespeople and say like, all right, these are bad patterns that the people leaving the trades don't allow it to exist in your life. What's your perspective? I think that it starts and they really start to, as they start to attend, you start to see it right away in their attendance. Some people understand how incredible of an opportunity this is to come here and to be paid to learn. It doesn't exist in a lot of places and they will take advantage of it. And others take, they take advantage of you and they think that it's going to be an easy road. And what ends up happening is they start to relax and maybe get a little too comfortable. And, you know, there's been plenty of times we've had to bring these folks in and have conversations with them about being serious, about being dedicated, about being a good teammate with the rest of your class. And it's a great lesson for them because if you have people that are calling out, people that aren't making it to work on time or regularly, just like when they're in the field as a technician, other people have to pick up the slack. You know, if I have, understand that our customers, they go to great lengths to make room in their lives so that we can come out and do the work, right? They take a day off of work or they, you know, they've accommodated us. And when you build routes and technicians are supposed to show up to work to run those routes and they don't, then it falls upon all the other technicians to pick up the slack or we're ending up calling and rescheduling calls, which you don't want to do that because, you know, you're just, you're upsetting your own service base. So I think it starts with the attendance, really. They, you know, two weeks in, you really start to see what these people are made of, right? Who's taking notes? Who's asking good questions? We have all of these technicians that are in the field already that when they have a ride along, they give us the feedback and they're like, hey, you know, this guy's fantastic. He's really going to be something great here. Or, you know, there's the other end of that too. So they seem to work their way out, right? We don't have to, we're not terminating them. Like they seem to just understand that, hey, this wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. And we've had a couple of people just stop showing up. And that's okay. I'd rather know now, right? I don't want to know after we have made this investment in you and you're driving one of our trucks around and, you know, we bought tools and all of this. I Just let me know now, right? Let's not waste each other's time. So. Do you notice that same, we'll call it a lack of passion, you know, or a misunderstanding of what the opportunity is? Do you notice that same issue existing in your, you know, three, four, seven, 10 year technicians in terms of like performance? Like, do you correlate low performers with low attendance and low performers with low passion and low performers or inversely, you know, high performers never call off. High performers are loving their trade and advancing and all those types of things. Do you see that correlation from the student world all the way into like the veterans? I think you do. I think that as a manager, our job here is to motivate and support and to ignite something in all of our field staff. And like you have to be great at it and you have to work on it every day because it's really easy for them to jump in the truck and to run their three calls and to just phone it in. And if you're not dangling a carrot in front of them, if you're not holding them accountable to certain KPIs, if you don't have a service manager that's communicating with them regularly, then what that's, you know, what ends up happening is that they just, they become the kind of technicians who are lazy and they will never move themselves up to the next level. Their own personal income will just flatline and always stay the same. And, you know, it's human nature to get complacent. And unless you make your workplace an interesting one and a fun one to be a part of, and you build some camaraderie with your guys, and you have a great team atmosphere going on, then you have a shot at, you know, a lot of them achieving more. You know, we spin the wheel, we motivate them. There's a group chat that celebrates everyone's successes. We feed these people, we do company events. We just, we try to do all of the things that keep them together, keep them focused, but we do a lot of training, right? Like 
there's classes that go on, you know, most every morning in all of our four centers. So, but you can't just, you know, to those companies out there that have a dozen technicians driving around and you're not doing meetings and you're not engaging with them and and you're not role playing and those companies, we know what their results are going to be, right? Those technicians that work for those companies, they're just, they're not going to be high achievers and, you know, they're writing their own destiny. And uh, I think that we have to help all of these folks with that. So speaking of that, in terms of, you know, taking your career to the next level from your chair and in all the things that you've seen at different companies and now at your own significantly multi-brand, multi-location company, you know, do you feel like there is a larger problem with lack of investment on the mechanical side or a lack of investment on the communications side? Like when you see your technicians, when you see field people, when you see trades people out there and you're seeing like, ah, oh, this could be so much better. Do you believe that there's a larger gap on like, we're just not pursuing enough technical training or a larger gap when we're not pursuing enough of the communications? That's a great question. I think that here in Southern California, we, it's a little different for us here. We don't have the weather that many people in many other places have, right? It doesn't matter if we're talking about the winter or the summer. And so my guys aren't in front of breakdowns all the time, right? My guys are running maintenance calls, you know, it's a hundred degrees somewhere today. And you got technicians that are running guilty. Yeah. You got technician. Exactly. You got tech. Yep. Good for you. Like, too you bad know, I'm God not an bless. HVAC. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just <laughs> miserable, sweaty plumbers and bitches and addicts. Oh, uh, I'm sorry for that. But I, what we wouldn't give for a little bit of that weather. There's a reason that there are 20 million people that live within, you know, 90 minutes of where I'm sitting, right? Nobody's from Los Angeles, right? Everybody moves here and they move here for our perfect weather. And when you're in the heating and air conditioning business, you know, there's a sacrifice you make. So our business here, it's different than, even our climate is different than service champions or, you know, any of the companies in the Valley or in Orange County. In West LA, you know, I'm 10 minutes from the ocean here, you know, and this is where our clientele is. Our clientele is right within 10 minutes of where we're at. So my guys have to be better. They have to be better than the technicians in Phoenix and Las Vegas and in Chicago and Denver and everywhere that has weather because we're running tune-ups, we're running maintenance, we're going out, we're changing filters and checking refrigerant levels and going in attics and taking pictures of duct work and attic insulation and educating people about indoor air quality and utility overspend and and this is how we have success, right? If we can't do that, we're out of business. But if we do that really well, we get service agreements, we get five-star reviews, and people choose us for replacement. But in the summertime, they're choosing us for replacement when it's in the 70s, not when it's 100 degrees. So it's a little bit different for us. We have to work probably a little harder. And maybe it makes for, you know, if you're a technician, I think that, you know, we follow a process and maybe it makes them a little more studious. Maybe it makes them listen a little more and not just rely upon, you know, some of the low hanging fruit, those heat breakdowns or those no cools. So, you know, I'm proud of what we've done. I'm proud of what we do every day here, but it's not easy. There are a lot of technicians across the country in different areas with climates that are beneficial for HVAC that sell like crazy in a summer and a winter and then on the shoulder seasons they can't do anything because the development isn't there i think it'd be great if everybody that was in a selling position could go somewhere like that and cut their teeth learn how to make it in the shoulder season which you live in 12 months a year and then when they get out and get to somewhere like you know phoenix vegas pennsylvania there with the winter they're they're good to go that's just a bonus it's like with anything, when it's too easy, you just end up getting complacent and you get lazy, right? You cut corners and uh, we run a very long tune up here. 
we're in the house for a long time. There's a lot of communication with the customer. We're showing them the before and the after, and we're putting on a show and that's our ticket to success, you know? So I think that, you know, the guys that we have here, I think that they understand that they have a lot to overcome and the communication with the customers, it's constant, but we really have to educate people. And we're just not walking into a system that's down. And uh, so we teach it every day. You have to constantly work on their game. And, but I'm proud of what our guys do here. And this business has grown a lot based upon running a great tune up. So let's talk about that from a practical level, Lawrence, and, and really like getting down to the street level, the, you know, the technician in the home, you know, you're saying you believe your technicians have to perform better. And, and Brian's saying like, that makes sense because, you know, you don't have the the highs and lows, you have, you know, consistent temperatures, which means to your, what you said earlier, you're not seeing tons and tons of breakdowns. So it's a lot of maintenance calls. It's a lot of the systems working okay right now calls. And so when you kind of think about all the things you've done at, at Brody and, and you know, the development that you've put into the technicians and, and what you're doing there in comparison to, you know, other places you've seen or other things that you've heard, what are some of the areas where you're, you're saying like, here's ways that you could actually take your career to the next level. Here's ways that you could take that presentation to the next level. Here's ways that you could take your communication, your selling, your whatever it is to the next level and stop crutching so much on these high temperature, low temperature swings or these, you know, hurricane seasons when of course everybody's buying generators, you know, you're going to be out of power for three weeks. So why wouldn't you buy a generator type of thing? Well, try selling a generator to somebody who hasn't lost power in the last five years you know, or electrical standpoint, or, or like, of course, you're going to buy a sub pump when uh, six inches of rain is coming through in three hours, you know, <laughs> that's easy. But what about when you don't remember the last time that you had that much rain in a single storm? So bringing that on the technician level, or the plumber, the electrician down on the street and in the home, what are some of the ways that you believe that they could become better, that they should start focusing on and say, like, here's ways that you need to be driving your career higher. Here's habits you need to be developing. Here's education you need to be giving yourself. I think that, and that's a great question. I think that we teach a process and that process works for us and for our guys. But of course, when you're in the home, you're a man on an island right? Like, you know, we can prepare you for any number of scenarios, but when you really get in there, it's just you and your ability to make a friend. And that's something that you've got to find from within you to have the success. You could do the best tune up on earth. And if you can't make someone feel comfortable and communicate well with them and you know, be a little persuasive, show them, you know, a great quality of work, then nothing's going to ever happen for you. You're going to be a technician whose average tickets are low and you're going to have a bunch of zero tickets and you're going to go through this agonizing exercise of doing this long tune up and you're going to have nothing to show for it. So I think that we can teach the process, but it's up to you to follow it, to always follow it and not deviate, to be well rehearsed, to refine your process regularly as you need to. You know, if things aren't working, then something's got to change. I think you need to learn from the other successful people in the business. We have a lot of people that have been here for 20 and 30 years, and those folks have been doing it for so long. And, you know, if I'm a young technician, I want to sit in the meeting room next to the guy who's been doing it for 30 years because that old dog has some tricks that he can teach me, right? You have all this at your disposal, but not everybody is the kind of person that's going to take advantage of these opportunities. So, you know, we can provide the teaching, we can educate them, but what they end up doing in the house, you know, it's really largely out of our control. So it's like raising kids. You raise them, you try to make good people out of them, and you're hoping when they're old enough that 
they're out there doing the right thing, right? They're not getting in a car with a bunch of kids who've been drinking, that they're respectful and they're not just doing bad stuff. If you've done your home or done your work in the home, then, you know, you have a better than average shot that they're going to be good people outside of the home. So same thing with your technicians. You just educate them, educate them, train them. And once they're in the position, you know, you probably have a decent shot that they're going to do a good job. That is important to remember, Lawrence. And I, I want to circle back to something you said there, you know, you're on an island when you're in the home. I mean, it's just you. Yes, you can get somebody on the phone and and yes, you've been trained, but it's just you, you know? It's like, I mean, the Olympics are coming up here, right? And I always enjoy watching them. And after years and years and years of training, four years of training, it all comes down to, in some cases, 10 seconds, you know? <laughs> it all comes down to your ability to execute on those things by yourself at that point. It no longer matters about your coaching. It no longer matters about anything except your ability to execute on all the things you've been working on. And you said something that kind of summarizes that it's about your ability to make a friend in the home. When you say that, like, what are some of the points that you would even advocate for in terms of like developing that relationship in, in getting to that status? Because some people are far more gifted at that than others. You know, Brian, he makes friends with trees because it's just so easy for him. Whereas other people just like people won't make friends with me. <laughs> Whereas other people, you know, it's not natural for them. They're, they're more engineer oriented. Like they think logically and not relationally, you know. And so help us all understand, like, what's some baselines that we can focus on to increase our friendship quantity when we're running these calls? It's called acting. Ooh. I think <laughs> Mic that, drop. and it is not everybody has it in them, right? Our mamas all gave us something different. And if we're going to go into a home when it's 74 degrees and it's a 20 year old system for them to consider replacement, we have to give them a superior experience. And if I know that I'm not an expert communicator, if I'm not that great with people, if I'm not confident, I know that I'm going to just not have great success. So I think all of us have to find that thing within us. I'll tell you what, when I get here in the mornings, it would be delightful to get my cup of coffee and to walk in my office and close the door and just have some solitude but I can't do that because I'm the leader of this organization and I have 300 people that are looking at me and they're taking their cue from me, right? I'm the leader and my positivity and my energy sets a tone and a level of expectation and I have to turn it on, right? I'm just like everybody else in the mornings. I don't like to talk to people. I, you know, I drive my commute and I get here and but I have to turn it on and I have to put on, you know, a huge smile and say hi to everybody and ask them how they're doing. And you do this so that, you know, you're making an impact. There are a lot of owners that just, they don't do that, but I have to do that. That's just been a part of what I've always done. But the point is that I have to be myself on steroids, you know, in the mornings because it's important. It's important for the organization. We had a great sales day yesterday. We're going to do the same thing again today. So proud of you guys. Thank you for all you do. You know, that stuff, like these are the things that I'm talking about when I'm walking through that parking lot in the morning. And if you're somebody who's not a natural communicator and you knock on that door, you have to find it within you. And it's not easy, but Somehow, some way, you have to become somebody different for the next 90 minutes of your life. They don't know you. They don't know if you're the best salesperson in the, in the company or, or if you've been there for four days and this is your first call. They have no idea. You can be whoever you want to, to them, right? And, you know, their success is going to be dictated by their ability to make a friend. It's really what this comes down to, right? If you do good work and have a great work ethic and show them and give them a great experience that, you know, that they're happy with and, and they feel good that they chose the right company, that's part of it. 
But if you don't have the communication skills to balance that out, and you're now not able to compel them to sign up for a service agreement or have a supervisor come out to talk about replacement, that stuff doesn't happen unless you have that piece. So if you don't have it, you got to find it. It's in there. We all have it in there, right? I love what you're saying, man. We don't probably don't talk about this enough, this channeling of a version of yourself. And it got me thinking when I was a younger tech and I didn't have this this ability to disarm and break walls. Like it, there's some parts of it that feel like they were natural to me. Like I wanted to be this person, but I, where I grew up in Detroit, it was a, it's a different place. And I was not trying to stand out any more than I already kind of naturally did. And, uh, learned to just be quiet and be shy and be afraid and really not, not do anything that drew attention to myself. But when I decided that that wasn't serving me anymore and I wanted to be this person, which really happened working for Ken Goodrich in Las Vegas, I would emulate his GM, who was my mentor, Lance Fernandez. I would say, you know, just kind of have that thing. What, what would Lance do? And I'd be walking up to the door with butterflies in my stomach of a client's home and nerves like crazy and palms sweating. And I would think, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And I would just, I would picture our GM like just lighting the room up in the morning meeting and I'd see him on the phone with what everyone thought would be a really hard customer to deal with. And he would just completely dismantle them and have them eaten out of his hand, you know, and I, and I would picture that and I would just go, I'm just going to be him for a minute. Was there anybody that, and it would work. It worked until eventually I just found out firsthand that all these silly fears I had about what might happen when that door opens were just utter nonsense and that the person who opened the door in most cases is actually as nervous or more nervous than I am. And I actually have the responsibility to disarm them, not the other way around. So, but you know, in the meantime, I had to channel what I call channel Lance, my inner Lance. Is there someone that you've emulated to do this, to become this naturally, or do you still see somebody in your head when it's time to open that office door, put the coffee down and perform? I think that, and I see this more and more in myself, like in the last four or five, six years, you work all these years to, you know, and you find yourself 25 years in and that's where I'm at now. But the decision-making, the way that I am with my people, I've really become a lot more like Leland, honestly. I learned so much from him and I always felt like he was always so fair and that he took a really measured approach to everything. You know, everything needed to be in writing, everything. If we were going to roll out a new process, it was going to be written. It was going to be discussed. It was going to be approved. We just didn't do things on the fly. And when anybody in these businesses tries to do something on the fly, it upsets me. Right. And I let them know that that's not the way that we do things. So I, I see a lot of him in what I do. I just try to take that approach. I think that he's been, you know, the greatest impact in my career for sure. And um, I learned a lot from him, learned a lot from Mr. Abrams too. And, you know, I can, I just, I hear him in my head and, you know, when you're not having success with a marketing piece, I remember him saying, you know, if you're going to move to a different marketing piece, you got to test it first. You don't just commit and send out 50,000 pieces. You test it. You test it. You know, these guys measured approach, just responsible operators. And this is why these guys were, you know, the people in the industry that so many people emulate and respect. Ken Goodrich among them, right? Like the stuff that he's done. I just, I, I love listening to him. He's so introspective and he's so, you know, he, he talks about the things that he wishes he would have done and, you know, and I, but I look at the things that he has done, you know, he's paved a way, right? There's just a lot of great guys out there, but certainly Leland is the one that I see, you know, a little bit of him in the way that I operate. I think to your point, Brian, like that's an excellent thing, you know, to really put a cap on this entire episode is like, who is that guy? And, and that's a question that should be asked regardless of what position, what industry, what role you have in any company. It's like, 
if you're a technician, find the best technician, do a ride along or three with them in their truck, see how they're in the home. And then that's your pattern. That's like your Tom Cruise or your, you know, your Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's the person that you're like, okay, in this moment, I got to flip that switch. If you're a CSR, find somebody who's selling a hundred agreements a month and booking 95% of their calls and sit and listen to them and understand and understand and hear what they say. And then pattern your way into that. If you're an administrator or a GM or an ops manager, if you're completely outside of the trades altogether, wherever you are, find that person who is killing it, get with them, understand what they do, learn, listen, they don't have to be the exact same personality. They don't have to be the exact same organization that you are or characteristics that you have, but it is that the emulation that you're putting towards them that you're trying to become is what is going to help you succeed in being able to flip that switch because now you actually have something to shoot for as opposed to, well, I think maybe if I did this, I think possibly I should do that. No, you actually have somebody who's already doing it and this is what success looks like. Can that work for you? Maybe, maybe not, but it gives you at least something to shoot for. And I think that's an important part of growing and taking your career to the next level. Yeah, we had a young lady on Amy last week who talked about, I forget where she said she was uh, sales wise, and then had heard a coral whale, who's a, she's a maintenance tech in Colorado. I think she's pushing three and a half million on maintenance, HVAC maintenance this year. And now, so Amy, I want to say she was around the 2 million mark, heard coral on our show, got in contact with her. She gave her some pointers and helped her with her presentation. And now all of a sudden she's going to do, she's on track to do 4.2 million this year herself. Wow. And it's like, incredible. Lawrence kind of wandered into service champions a couple of decades ago and locked out like I did a couple of decades ago into, yes, plumbing, heating, and air and got around Ken Goodrich in them. And we just, we knocked on the right door. Like it's <laughs> probably somewhat accidentally. But now to Nate's point, you don't have to leave your house to get in contact with these people. Amy was probably in her bedroom when she had correspondence with Coral via her phone, you know, because you can just, well, shoot, if you're listening to somebody on here, you can just get on social media and shoot me a Facebook message or jump in the Waste No Day Facebook group and just post in there. You're looking to get a hold of this person. I assure you, somebody's going to connect you with them now. It's, it might be even too easy at this point where it just, it just doesn't seem valuable but it's valuable. Take that step and take that leap and get that mentor going. And Nate said it doesn't have to be someone with your characteristics or maybe temperament. Probably better to not be like as far away from your own personality as possible is really the mentors you're looking for, or at least this supremely upgraded version of you and your personality. But in what you really want is somebody that's going to stretch you and pull you into very uncomfortable places to get to the next iteration of yourself. And this is why the work that you guys do is so important, right? I had to walk into the right building, which ended up changing my life, right? I walked into the right building and I met the right person who was going to be a great mentor and role model, someone who I could learn how to do this from how to run a successful heating and air conditioning company, a profitable heating and air conditioning company, how to hire people and recruit people and train them and manage them. I walked into the right building, but what you guys are doing is you're bringing all of this stuff to us, right? It's changed and it's, it's invaluable. You know, here I am all these years in. And when I see that Ken Goodrich is going to be you know, there's an hour with him recorded. I'm listening there. Right? Count me in. <laughs> yeah. It's free to me. It's free. And I know that I'm going to have some takeaways and we're just benefiting from his career of, you know, incredible accomplishments. The world has changed. Right. And, you know, hold on, hold on. You either take advantage of it or you don't just scale it back on the free part there, buddy. It costs, it costs <laughs> you to get everyone, it you does. know, to leave an Apple podcast review and start downloading the show <laughs> and share it with all their friends and family there and get go. their wife and their kids, there we go. Uh, tablets and phones, and then leave reviews on theirs too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think the cost on that is fair. I think that's a fair price of admission. Small price to pay, right? <laughs> I agree. I agree. The price is the investment that comes after it. 
I mean, otherwise you just become this uh, surveyor of knowledge, but rarely applying it in the field. And we talked about that a time or two on this show before, but like that, that's the cost. The cost is what are you going to do with it? You know, all the knowledge in the world means very little if it doesn't change your life or change you. And, you know, there's, I don't know, 200, 300 episodes now of killer knowledge here. Have you changed? Like, you know, as a listener, I'm talking to you. Have you changed? Have you actually been impacted in a way that has been for the better? Has it stayed consistent? Like, have you made a change that has been sustained? Or are you going on this roller coaster ride where you're like hitting the high of an episode two weeks ago and then you're like, oh, well, here's another thing. I'll try that. Like, don't do that. Find something that you can actually apply and, and sustain it in your life. You know, don't keep doing this swing variation of knowledge education where you're like hitting something that a, a guest said three weeks ago and, and you're doing that for three days and then another Monday comes and you completely shift focus. You're like, go hard and go deep on something and make it a difference in your life and make it something that is going to stay there. That's how you get growth and incremental growth is by applying those things in such a way that they just become part of who you are and part of what you do. And then it's no longer a challenge. It's no longer something that you have to focus on anymore. It's just part of breathing for you, right? And then you get to actually focus on something different. And that, that can be such a game changer when it comes to elevating your career or your personal life for that matter. Amen to that. And to your point, I've seen far too many very small contractors, you know, unsophisticated, just trying to find their way. And they've actually put themselves... You know, they're following the path of people who have $100 million businesses. And really, they just have to, you know, they have to take that for what it is, but also realize that, you know, that'll wreck you, right? Listen to these podcasts, you know, go to these events, take this information and dissect it and put as much of it as you can to use. But spend as little as you can if you're in the infancy of your business because you know you need that capital you know i know one guy he just he spent a fortune on getting the branding and i'm just like man like you got to work on getting the phone to ring and training your people just that whole <laughs> truck wrap you'll, you'll get it done but it's not the first thing you need to do it is uh it's more glamorous for sure but Fame is, is not often in the outside, but on what comes on the inside when it comes to like sustained success. And I mean, doubling down on that again, like don't become that shooting star that burns out, you know, <laughs> six months later. And like, you know, you're following all these social media posts and everything about what everybody's doing, but you're not dialed in on the basics and, and you're going to, yeah, you're going to kill yourself. As we're bringing things in for a landing here, Lawrence, you know, before we wrap up with some final questions, if people are loving what they're hearing and what you're saying, uh, or they're interested in learning more about Brody Pinnell or any of the things that you got going on there in California, where is a great place to get connected with you? The best and easiest way is just to email me, right? I, uh, I read my own, my own emails, although I will admit that with what I have going on, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a few days behind right now, right? But I'm uh, Lawrence at BrodyPanel.com. Panel is two N's and two L's. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to help as I can. And uh, sometimes I'll point you in the direction of somebody who's probably better suited to help you. But, you know, have really come in contact with a lot of great contractors over the last few years who really just want to be successful. And they hear, you know, they hear the podcast or they read something, an article, and I really appreciate, you know, that people reach out. They're just looking for that next step and how to go from three trucks to 10 or how to go from 10 to 20. And, um, you know, I don't have all the answers, but I, I have a few of them. So always happy to help. Appreciate that. And I know our listeners do as well. Before we wrap things up, buddy, you talked about going to the shows and listening to the podcast. Freedom, Home Service Freedom, Tommy's event in San Diego this year. Are you going to be there? Going to do my best. I think that 
you know, what he's done is, wow, like the success is just incredible. And any time that I've had a chance to be there to see him speak, there's so much to learn. You know, he's just such a real dude. And, you know, he treats his people so well and he's made it happen. So yes, anytime I can get to, I was in San Diego yesterday at, at our location down there. So anytime I I can get down there. I take advantage of that. So yeah, you can probably count on me being there. We'll have a waste no day promo code. I'll shoot it over to you. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> when the good. time comes around, but I would, uh, whether you go or not, I would love to meet up with you while we're there. My wife and I'll be there for sure. Sure. That's great. All right. So as uh, so we're, we're bringing it in for a close here, Lawrence, you know, this concept of taking your career to the next level and experiencing those sustained results. I'm sure over the years, you've seen people who learn differently and who apply differently, right? You know, there's some guys who they need some, they need a mentor who is just going to be on their shoulder and asking them every single moment, like, Hey, are you doing this thing? Are you doing that thing? Like, how's it going? Other people are much more autonomous. And like, if you just give them a system, like they just pick the system and they'll go with it. They just need to be enlightened to like a new system. You know, other people, they look for uh, group camaraderie and they're, you know, they're cheerleaders and they're looking for cheerleaders in their life type of thing. And there's all these different styles of learning and styles of improving. And that's, that's good and fine because, you know, people are people and they're certainly different in their personalities and their approaches. But I think there has to be, you know, some basic concepts in terms of what it means to actually, well, A, desire to improve, right? To reject that complacency and want to get to that next level, but be in like experiencing that sustained success where you actually have made a change in your career, not in your career, but like in your methodology in what you do, whether it's sales or technical or whatever, you've made a change and you've actually experienced that growth. Can you identify any type of like universal concepts in terms of when I see people excelling, when I see people growing, when I see people hitting that next level, finding that next gear in their role or in the company, these are some of the things I observe because that's a question that you have to, that when you are looking across the company, you see all these different personalities and yet different personalities have the ability to, they all have the ability to succeed and excel. So are you able to identify any like common denominators of people who are actually stepping into new levels of success, new levels of growth, even if they're as wild and, you know, party friendly as Brian or as more introverted as I am? And what are these, some of these things that you can leave our audience with to say, like, here's what success looks like when I see it. These are the things people are dialed in on. Great question. And I'll, I'll speak to it you know, as I see it here at Brody, but we work so hard to recruit and hire people into this business, you know, from all walks of life. And you just use your gut instinct to make a good decision and say that, Hey, I think this person could help us. I think that they could be a good, a good piece and they would do well with our customers. So we work hard to bring them in and you're betting on them. But the real question is, is once they're in the door, what are they going to do to separate themselves from their peers? What are they going to do to make their own breaks to make it a career and not just a job? What are they going to do to be noticed? And I've seen it all up and down the board, right? If it's for field personnel, if it's a service technician, there are the ones that have a written plan and track their numbers and set benchmarks and reward themselves for their progress. And they set goals, right? And the people that do that, they're achievers. And the ones that don't do that and get comfortable and, you know, they don't measure their success. We just, we know where that ends up. And, you know, I think that some people are just organized, right? Organization can take you places that, and honestly, Service Champions is such a great example of that. You know, you walked, when I first walked in the door there, I was like, am I in an air conditioning company? Because this doesn't look like any air conditioning business that I've ever been in, right? It looked like, you know, I was on the 75th floor of a high rise office building downtown. Like everything looked great. And, you know, it was just, it was so impressive. 
And it still looks like that, right? It still doesn't look like an air conditioning company, you know? Some of these air conditioning companies you walk into, you know, you look at that parking lot and you look at that warehouse and you look at those offices and boy, you know, you see the other side of it, but organization. And I think that that was such a big key in the success of, of service champions. And, but it, you know, the people, right? If you as a person can be organized enough to have a written plan and to set goals for yourself, I think that's the first step. If you're not able to even do that, you know, when they talk about the military, what's the first thing that they want to know is if they're going to let you carry a gun, they want to know that you can make your bed, right? If this guy can make his bed, maybe we can trust him at some point to carry a gun. But if you can't even make your own bed, then you get out of the bed and, and 10 seconds after your feet hit the floor, your day is starting. And the simplest and quickest thing that you can do is just to clean up the mess behind you by making that bed. That's organization. And it starts there. And if you have it in your life, then it's a leg up. And if you don't, then you need to learn it because all the great people that work in this business here at Brody, they are that person. They want to know what their performance looks like. They want to know how they, I get people that walk into my office at Brody before we even publish the numbers. They want to know the numbers. They want to know where they stand, right? Is there something I can do in the last two or three days of the month to catch up with my peers or to pass them? You know, some folks just, they're competitive. And as managers, that's our job to to make sure that that competitive fire is burning within all of them, right? There are contests, there are prizes, there are, and you hype everybody up. This is what makes performers, but that's our job. We have to do that, right? We're the leaders. They rely upon us. And, uh, you know, the successful businesses have leaders who are doing that for their, for their employees. So... I don't know if that answered your question, but. I mean, I believe what, what you're saying there is, you know, organization is going to give you the foundation to build your success upon. And if you're not organized, you probably need to find somebody to help you get organized or to keep you accountable to some level of it. Uh, and that's, you know, that's where I agree with you. There's a lot of sustainability that comes with organization systems. You know, some people are system adverse, like it's just not how they think. And they'll, they are quite capable of having incredible success. You know, some of the best high performers that I know are not systems organized people, but they either surround themselves with people that will help them do that, who are systems oriented and organized, or they compensate by having, you know, force themselves into different areas of growth to become more organized. It takes both personalities, both styles of leadership and operation and technicians to be able to succeed at a sustained level. And I appreciate you bringing that to our attention today. Lawrence, it has been great to have you on the show. We appreciate you stopping by and dropping a lot of this wisdom with us. And I know our audience does as well. I know your co-host does. It's always great to talk to you, Lawrence. I really appreciate you don't do a whole lot, man. You don't even have a Facebook account, do you? I do not. I do not. I, uh, <laughs> See, I fear that if I did, I'd be in all those groups and I probably wouldn't get as much done as, as I need to here. So you're absolutely right. <laughs> you are absolutely right. Yeah. You sh but you should at least pay somebody to go ahead and run you a Facebook account, but, uh, you don't do a lot and Maybe you don't seek do a lot of attention. So I, I feel blessed and, and honored to get you on the phone or on this show, uh, for sure. So I really appreciate that, man. Brian, it's always a pleasure, Nate, I just talking to you guys and the great stuff that you guys are putting out, the content for all of us contractors to benefit from. I thank you both. You know, I think that you've built a vault of great information that can help all of us. So if not enough people thank you, you know, thank you. It's helped me and I'm sure there are a ton of other contractors that it's done the same for. Well, you are absolutely welcome. And that is a wrap for this episode. We hope that you enjoyed your time with Lawrence. It was great to have him back on the show. If you haven't heard his original episode with us, make sure you go back and check that out. Again, it is back from January 23rd of 2023. 
and you'll be pleased with that one just as much as you are with this one. No shortage of great advice on today's show, especially with things like organization and focusing on taking your career to the next level. And a really good impactful part that I appreciated was the ability to focus on acting in a way that it is calling yourself to a higher standard, even when you don't feel it, even when it doesn't seem like your natural tendency, being able to emulate somebody that you know is successful, even if it's not necessarily true for them, the belief that you think they would do better is going to call you to do better as well. And what a great impactful message that Lawrence brought to us today. We wanna leave you now with our weekly challenge, which continues to be the same, to choose to wake up each and every morning and waste no day. <laughs>